today, besides a lot of beautiful pictures of Switzerland where I was, was uh, a little bit of a view into what happens in a public-private partnership, which is a nonprofit that's supposed to encourage drug development where the market is broken. And that, that's certainly the case in anti-malarials, where the vast, vast majority of anti-malarials are, are, are sold uh, without, a, uh, without a sizable profit for the uh, uh, developing industry. Uh, so, uh, Len, thanks for that, that introduction. I didn't see that, uh, uh, that uh, New York Times piece, but uh, I did hear Obama wanted to make that part of the frontispiece piece for his last year. And I, my one thought is, that's great. And then another thought is, why'd you wait seven years? But, uh, he, there are a lot of challenges to eradicating and eliminating malaria. One of those challenges can be overcome with uh, better drugs, and I'll talk about that as I go through this. But this uh, picture on the front is uh, the Chillon Castle in, in Montreux, uh, which was just uh, about uh, uh, 40 kilometers from where we were living. A uh, beautiful castle that uh, protected uh, Lake Geneva and allowed them to collect lots of taxes. Uh, as you can imagine, that's always been important to governments like uh, the Swiss. So in terms of disclosures that are relevant to this uh, talk, I really have none to report, except that uh, Medicines for Malaria uh, did pay me to work there. So I guess as an employee, I could report that. Uh, this was my uh, going away party here at South Lake Union. Ryan Choi uh, uh, drew this with a felt marker. Uh, this beautiful <laughs> picture of, of uh, Geneva. And it, it gave fun facts such as that uh, prostitution is legal in Geneva. I was <laughs> turning red when they took the picture next to my wife. But, uh, <laughs> and where we, where we were was in uh, Geneva, uh, down here where the arrow is, down at the point. As far as I can tell, this part of Switzerland was created to uh, stick it to the Catholic uh, 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 French who... Uh, uh, who were basically surrounding this whole area and, and repeatedly tried to take over Geneva from the Protestant uh, area. And they had lots of festivals that, uh, when they fought off the French uh, Catholics to retain their uh, local uh, flavor or whatever. Geneva, as you know, has been a money laundering area for many, many years, and uh, it's very hard to establish a bank account there. And if you're an American, let me tell you, after they find most of the banks there, about $4 billion each. We lived out of town because we couldn't afford to live in Geneva in a wonderful place called Nyon. Uh, it's kind of a vacation village just up the lake that many uh, Genevans go to. Uh, it feels very Mediterranean for Switzerland. Uh, and this is uh, 
It's filled with lots of vineyards surrounded by mountains. Uh, about 14% of Geneva is arable, so, uh, and, and it feels like 10% of, uh, of, of 14% is covered with grapevines because they make a ton of uh, Swiss wine. 98% uh, of it is consumed locally, probably because no place else in the world can they afford to buy it. <laughs> um, good? What's, it's pretty good, actually, uh, but you, the, you really have to pay for anything that's great. <laughs> about three times uh, what you would for a French wine that's comparable. Uh, this is out on Lake Geneva, just showing you the opposite side of the coast, which is uh, French, and uh, it's fun to just take a boat across and, and eat for about half price and at a really uh, great French restaurant. And this is our downtown, Nyon, uh, was a, uh, a Roman trade center. Uh, again, uh, they were collecting taxes too, so most of the uh, area of Switzerland is, is very important to commerce because it links southern uh, Europe to northern Europe uh, through mountain passes. And, uh, uh, the Romans and many others have been active in this space. And this was, we lived in a very nice house. Nobody else I knew uh, actually had a backyard like us that went down to a creek. Uh, for those of you who have been out to my house, it's very similar to our house in Seattle, surprisingly. Uh, uh, this uh, this is my wife Deborah and our dog. Uh, if you ask me who's who, I'm gonna I'm gonna punch you in the nose. But and, and then there's me. Uh, and and we were out out there just right on the edge of the uh, countryside. They're growing lots of uh, flowers for oil and so on, uh, sunflower oil. So malaria is still a relevant issue. Uh, I'm gonna switch gears and talk about medicines for malaria uh, venture. Though the numbers have come down about 50 percent in the last uh, decade. Uh, in terms of, of deaths and so on. So it used to be uh, thought to be about a billion people a year uh, sick uh, uh, two decades ago, and that's come down to 150 to 300 million in the most recent uh, WHO estimates. And the death rates have come down to about uh, just under half a million a year. Uh, almost all those death rates are happening in Africa, where it's one to five-year-old African children. You can see the the shadow of the Anopheli mosquito over, uh, over sub-Saharan Africa, where it has its uh, biggest impact. The Anopheli obviously being the vector that transmits some malaria. And if you, it's hard to think about how many uh, children are, are killed every day uh, from this. But you know, if you think about your daycare, where your kid goes, uh, and 12 kids there, then it's like 200 daycare centers a, a day wiped out. Uh, so, or one kid every 20 seconds, and this is still, you know, a public health emergency. So what's needed now, what's Obama trying to get uh, uh, really going to bring these numbers down even more? The things that have been really effective lately have been insecticide-treated bed nets. That's a challenge because uh, some of the anopheles are becoming resistant to the insecticide that's used, but still, they're, they're one of the most effective and cheapest interventions they bring the rates down uh, about 70% if used effectively on, on little children uh, from dusk to dawn. There's a vaccine that's been licensed uh, 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 by the EMA, uh, and it uh, provides uh, uh, embarrassingly low protection, uh, something between 50 and 30% protection, and the, the effect is low. You have to give... Uh, uh, four doses uh, needing a, co a cold chain to children, and the effect is lost after functionally 75% uh, of the effect is lost in a year. So there needs to be a booster campaign and so on. So vaccines are not so promising, but drugs actually as an almost vaccinating or uh, uh, getting kids over this critical time from one to five years old uh, may, may offer a, a big help in this area. The issues with drugs is there's resistance uh, coming up to the most used drug around the world. That's artemisinin combination therapy, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia. Um, and that typically those drug resistances have spread to Africa, where the big problem is in a relatively short period of time. Uh, so the WHO is trying to contain that drug resistance problem into Southeast Asia and not let it spread to Africa. It's a tall order. So the the uh, well, it's one question. Yeah, you sure. mentioned dust to dawn. 
this is just naive, but the mosquitoes only active then? What about daytime hours? Yeah, they, they, they don't tend to bite at all at, during daytime hours. They tend to hide out during daytime hours and come out at dusk to dawn. So just they start biting just as the sun's setting and, and bite throughout the night and then uh, uh, basically go away at dawn. So it's effective to uh, protect yourself just at nighttime. That's why bed nets work so well for little children. Um, let me switch ahead and talk a little about, about medicines for malaria adventure. So Medicines for Malaria Venture, as I mentioned before, is a product development partnership with a public health focus. They're a Swiss foundation based in Geneva, and they were established in uh, about 15 years ago by the uh, WHO and the World Bank Rockefeller Foundation in Switzerland. And what their uh, mission is to uh, develop new anti-malarial drugs, they have over 50 product projects uh, ranging from discovery to phase three and four and uh, post marketing, uh, and they've they've uh, already generated five approved products, um, and I'll talk to you about some of the products I was involved with. My big panel of work uh, is outlined here briefly. I supported the clinical group at uh, uh, Medicines for Malaria uh, Venture, led by uh, Stefan Bupar. Uh, when I arrived, there were only two MDs, and I was the third. And we uh, uh, helped uh, man these clinical trials that were ongoing of a new drug that's related to artemisinins but gets around artemisinin resistance cause, called OZ439. And it's uh, combined with a couple of other drugs to prevent resistance from emerging uh, here, piperiquin and ferroquin. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more. I supported also the discovery side that was led by Jeremy Burroughs. I ran a grant program, I uh, found that was very challenging and, and uh, realized that uh, program officers uh, have a hard job. Uh, I developed a pathway for early target identification, which I won't talk about, supported external partners, that would be people like myself that had uh, some kind of lead and uh, wanted to get involved with MMV, help them get those uh, early uh, uh, drugs tested. I uh, staffed the Structure-Based uh, Drug Development Consortium, gathered data for something called the Malaria Box I'll talk about later, and supported the Pathogen Box. And I also uh, worked part-time for the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Strategy Group for Cryptosporidium, uh, running a, um, uh, an international group that was helping uh, the Gates Foundation on that. So uh, this shows you the pipeline of, of MMD supported projects broken down by where they are. And uh, these are the approved drugs that they've been involved with. A lot of them are uh, related to artemisinin combinations that are new or reformulated for children uh, uh, when, when there were times that they weren't available for children or for uh, uh, kid use, like uh, for uh, rectal art artesanate for very severe uh, malaria when you couldn't get it in an IV and so on. The, the things that I was working on in staffing uh, were over here in the patient, uh, so-called patient exploratory or phase two uh, type studies. And uh, those were uh, uh, drugs that we had uh, field sites in Asia, Africa, and South America that were testing these drugs under actual field conditions. And we were very excited uh, for how they were going. They were showing great safety and so on. And then MMB pushes these early drugs very quickly into human volunteers. They have a human challenge center uh, uh, that's uh, located in Australia where they actually inject malaria IV into Australian volunteers where malaria is not endemic, wait a couple of days and then start treating them. And they follow their malaria in their blood uh, by PCR. And so they're able to detect infections before the patient's ever sick and treat the, uh, and start to treat them with these experimental drugs, uh, watch what happens to the parasitemia, and then actually if, if they ha still have a rise in parasitemia but are not yet symptomatic, they treat them with an effective drug that's already available for that. Yes? Who do you get to volunteer for that? Who do you get to volunteer for that? Uh, you know, we do a similar study over here at, at CIDR, Seattle Biomedical, it used to be called. And uh, usually it's, it's students that are very interested in being active in global health. They get paid a couple of thousand dollars, so they like that too. But uh, yeah, it's surprising uh, uh, how many volunteers you can find that will do that. 
Uh, I no can say that uh, there's, there uh, have been no deaths in, in the malaria challenge field, and, and it's very rare for anybody to have any symptoms. Len, you have a well, I, just, there's no placebo group. Everybody knows they're going to get active treatment if they get chronically ill. Yeah, um, for the for, actually for the vaccine trials, there is a placebo group, but nobody gets clinically ill because we can detect the parasites before they even get sick. So it's it's. Uh, using the subclinical PCR to monitor the patients. A few, do a few patients have headaches and fevers, but the rare. primate they response, can they test it effectively there? Is there sufficient differences for, I mean, for these new drugs? I mean, do they do primates. that before the human study? Or? Yeah, the primates have been uh, variably uh, poor in terms of predicting uh, how the drugs come out and so on. They have really quite different uh, uh, SIP P450s and metabolism and so on. So uh, the MMB has rejected going into primates. They basically go from a skid mouse that has plasmodium falciparum, human malaria and human red cells in it, to try and figure out the rate of kill and so on into humans as the next step. Uh, because every other trial model, including primates, has been poor in predicting outcome. It's a bit going that way now for HIV vaccines and a variety of other things too. Yeah, I was just curious, do they have future protection if you get, um, is there an antibody response to being injected with malaria and is there any advantage to them of getting experimental malaria? Yeah, the question was, is there, is there any protection and so on uh, for subclinical malaria? In fact, there seems to be that if people get a, sub, uh, a subclinical parasitemia, they do develop antibodies and then um, there's, there's a group that, uh, at um, Biden, I believe, who used uh, repeated challenges and three doses of chloroquine to beat it down. They demonstrated that they got subclinical infection. And with, um, I think it was three, it might be five challenges like that, they got absolute protection. So it's interesting that it can develop even with subclinical malaria. For how long? Uh, they, they had protection at least two years in many of the volunteers. So. Um, so there's now a lot of studies going on about infection-based uh, 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 drug therapy and so on that might protect uh, kids and so on. Is that specific for that type of malaria or is it broad spectrum for Yeah, we don't know that. There's no challenge model that I'm aware of currently for Vivax, Ovalley, um, the, other, the other species, malaria, et cetera. Um, okay, so... Um, so I was supporting these projects as the medical advisor, and what we were really trying to do with these projects is to develop a single dose of malaria cure. And so the Oz-439, Paperiquin and Oz-439 uh, Ferroquin studies were set up so that uh, uh, volunteers would take a single dose of, of this uh, drug. It would actually hang out in their, in their blood system, unlike um, Artemisins, which are cleared in a matter of, of uh, hours, uh, these drugs hung out for two weeks in their bloodstream and uh, provided uh, prolonged protection against malaria and, and uh, with a single dose wiped out uh, malaria uh, in uh, phase 2A trials, uh, which are the, you know, the small numbers. We had moved to a phase 2B to investigate this uh, uh, one dose because we thought that the, the single dose, uh, even where our amnesinins were still effective, would be uh, used with high compliance. It's been shown that uh, the current therapies that require six to nine doses over three days are very poorly, uh, very poorly uh, taken by people. It's, it's about 90% of people have pills left after they're, they're dispensed the course, even though they're they're, they're warned that they may be generating resistance against this if they don't take their whole uh, course. They still don't do it. Even, even medical doctors only are about 80% compliant, so it's interesting. Um, so, and the other advantage of this single dose, actually, is in something like what Obama wants to do, where you eliminate and then eradicate malaria, you could go through, a with a very safe drug, go through and instead of testing anyone, go through a village where we already know that over 80% uh, of the people have low-level parasitemia in them, and basically treat everyone, and then uh, move on to the next village. That village would still be protected for a couple of weeks, and the mosquitoes by that time uh, would not be transmitting malaria, 
Uh, so in theory, you could, you could go from village to village to village spreading outwards in sort of a radius and eliminate malaria from a certain area then finally eliminate it from a country and then eliminate it from a continent and eradicate it from the earth, uh, assuming you know, it worked well. So um, the other thing about this combination is that uh, it uh, was effective against these new resistant strains that are coming out of Southeast Asia where uh, our Mesin combination therapy has failed. So uh, these are the two partners that we were looking at, uh, Paparaquin, which which is interesting is if, for those of you that are chemists, you'll recognize that this is basically half of uh, chloroquine linked by a, a linker here. So this, is, this part is chloroquine, this is a linker, and by doing that, it gets around chloroquine resistance, which is thought to be a pump. Uh, it fouls up the pump and allows this to continue to kill. And then this is another uh, uh, very closely related chloroquine-like molecule that includes an iron compound. Paraquin. So these are both an old drug uh, modified slightly to become a new drug, and they help a great deal in terms of there's no uh, resistance to these, uh, would stop transmission uh, fairly rapidly, uh, safe enough to consider mass drug administration, and uh, uh, and so on. And what what we did over the course of the year was march down the age bands in this uh, phase two B trial. Uh, where we were giving uh, the single dose to uh, first to adults to see if it would cure them and then younger and younger individuals until we were down to six month old children. Uh, they, were, uh, they were felt to be the most vulnerable because they had absolutely no immunity to help you with the therapy and we were getting cures in the six month old uh, children. We actually were functionally blinded about this study and the study still hasn't been unleashed but we could look at what drugs they were using in the study population and we could see that they weren't using rescue anti-malarial. So we were fairly certain that it was uh, fairly effective. So that, that was very exciting and uh, you know, it was a tiny bit uh, one could put in towards a drug like this that will be a game changer, we hope. What's the mechanism of kill, much like we think penicillin kills by this mechanism? How do these drugs function? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, much like there's still arguments over how penicillin kills, does it hit this penicillin binding protein or that penicillin binding protein, there's still arguments about how these drugs kill. These ferroquin and piperiquin appear to intercalate in between the hemozoan that stacks up uh, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in the food vacuole that's from digested hemoglobin, right? That's how malaria lives. And so it allows uh, oxidative iron to escape and kill uh, basically the, the parasite that's inside. Um, OS439 has a very unstable oxygen uh, atom here uh, that is similar to what's seen in uh, artemisinin. It's felt that this breaks open and then attacks, and, and it breaks open in high iron type uh, environments, preferentially, where the uh, parasite hangs out and, uh, and oxidizes and attaches to critical proteins all throughout the malaria parasite. They, that's a bit of hand-waving because nobody's really sure how it works. The mechanism of resistance is a pump of this uh, coming out of the cell, or at least that's the best theory that, that suggests that that's, that's the resistance coming out of, China, out of China. So it doesn't tell us about its mechanism of action, per se. So um, I think I'm going to skip that and, and go on to the next thing. I just wanted to show you a few pictures. We traveled around... Uh, Switzerland a great deal. This is a view of the Eiger from Grindelwald, a beautiful little town. The food was great. Uh, we were uh, just uh, three kilometers from France, and so we would scoot over the border and buy a bunch of cheese and zip back and uh, <laughs> make these wonderful meals. Um, this Deborah, my wife, was a wonderful cook, and we, we uh, frequently had the neighbors over for uh, outdoor food. So one of my other jobs was, uh, and this is not Deborah, but uh, it was to uh, uh, find the right partner. So as I mentioned earlier and, and brushed by, uh, it's felt that all anti-malarial drugs should be turned out and pair by pair uh, so that uh, we don't breed resistance to the, to the drugs. And this has uh, been shown in vitro for most of the available drug candidates that you can select for a resistance in vitro uh, so we don't want to see that in vivo anymore, 
And so the question is, is how do you, how do you select the right drug partner? Uh, do you pick something that's already developed and out on the market? Potentially that already has resistance, or do you pick something that's, that's cool and new? And how much do you have to, do you have to wait to decide what's the, what's the best next partner? So what we what I did was uh, uh, I it was uh, I was brought into a conference and they, these wonderful people that know a lot about malaria drugs were in that conference and every like any com committee meeting you want to watch the body language and uh, they all moved away from the table and they said Wes you are the leader of this and <laughs> so I ended up doing you know ninety nine percent of the work but they were wonderful uh, confidants on this. Um, so what, what the committee came up with was 13 scoring factors for optimal combinations for this so-called CIRCAP. This is the single dose eradication and cure uh, drug. And uh, the, you know, the, the scoring was uh, you know, based on these things that as MDs we can all relate to. It's efficacy for what it's supposed to do, a single dose cure and radical protection. It's safety, uh, and we, we gave the safety score a very prominent part of this. Uh, and we had to weigh the preclinical candidates, which had only preclinical data, animal data, versus those that had been in humans where there was some available human data, and we weighed that higher, obviously, than those that just had animal data. Uh, we would look at well, whether the drug's been approved because it was more likely to become a, a candidate uh, more quickly. Uh, versus those that were still in preclinical stages. Um, whether they had matched uh, pharmacokinetics was very important, and their time over uh, the minimum parasitidal concentration was important. Uh, whether they had formulation issues, I learned this is a big problem with a lot of drugs, that you can't, if you can't make it into a pill that actually dissolves reproducibly in people's stomachs and, and gives you the same amount of exposure in the bloodstream, then you're really dead. Um, whether it would kill the liver stage of malaria, and talked about the various stages, but there's both the liver stage and gametocytes that need to be interrupted uh, for transmission. Uh, whether there was known resistance, whether it had problems with if you took it with food or not. Most malaria patients are, are, are functionally fasting because they're anorectic when they're sick, uh, but not true so much in a mass drug administration type uh, situation. Um, whether they're drug drug interactions between the two partners or other medications people might be taking, such as HIV medicines or tuberculosis medicines, uh, they hopefully would have different mechanisms of action. And then uh, flexibility around the IP. Uh, there are certain companies that would would not be willing to work with other companies for historical reasons, and so we tried to factor that in. Though that turned out to be a very uh, unpopular uh, weighting. And, and so the readout was uh, quantitative for each of these combinations and allowed really ranking of pairs. And uh, all of these could be weighted on real time, uh, but I'll show you the weighting that we gave, which was uh, to give higher weighting to uh, combinations that had better safety scores and were more efficacious. And so this ended up in quantitative uh, choices of drugs that were under development by uh, medicines for malaria, or uh, we're already in clinical use, uh, such as mefloquine uh, down here, uh, which had a very poor score because of poor uh, safety and tolerance issues. So it, it gave us finally, for the first time, a, a completely quantitative score to look at right, what the right partners were. And MMB continues to use this, and I'm going back in uh, March to help update this uh, score uh, with the newest information. This shows you uh, uh, basically the prioritization uh, for combinations for another use. So I mentioned that the other one is for single dose cure and radical prophylaxis. This is for chemo pro protection. Uh, more and more in trying to abate uh, pregnancy related uh, losses and uh, little children deaths, uh, malaria medicines are given quarterly in areas where uh, malaria is endemic, and that's so-called chemo protection. Uh, and one uh, would want a different kind of weighting for this that would include higher weighting for uh, safety and pregnancy and other other issues. Um, so 
Uh, any questions about the combination therapy or anything like that? Good. This is Deborah. Uh, we, we lived about uh, two minutes from this farm. She became very attached to one of the cows there that was called 0157 by the little yellow cat. Uh, so we ceased eating beef. Uh, so if anyone wants to take me out for a steak, I'm ready. Uh, but anyway, this was really cool. You could go to this farm and pop a few francs in the uh, milk dispenser and pick up uh, wonderfully fresh milk, which I suspect wasn't pasteurized almost any time, uh, day or night. Uh, the Swiss were very fond of their cattle, and uh, at the uh, in the fall, they had the dissolve uh, ceremony where uh, in... Uh, October, they would march the cattle down from the high Alps, uh, anticipating the snows that were coming. They'd been up there feeding all year. And they would decorate the cattle that were the uh, hyper -producers, producers of, my, of uh, milk. And this lady was uh, very distinguished in her output of uh, milk. Up in the high Alps, they actually take the milk up there and, and uh, process cheese and caves. And uh, you can buy this wonderful uh, Swiss type cheese uh, in uh, markets here. Uh, hiking was wonderful there. It, this is uh, uh, on this side. Uh, this is Andy Stigachis, who was a visiting professor who came there. Uh, we're hiking up in the Jura, the uh, low Alps that are uh, uh, close to our house, and uh, Lake uh, Le Mans or Lake Geneva is here in the background. This is up hiking in the uh, higher Alps. Uh, with Andrew uh, Hemphill, who's a uh, veterinary professor there in Switzerland. This is a bicycling that was uh, fun to just hop out of the house and ride down the lake every day. Uh, the water was wonderfully pure, pure and about 90% of the stops had a fountain like this, and uh, the fountains would be unmarked if it was potable water and marked if it was non-potable water. So I don't think I picked up Giardia there drinking the, uh, uh, the so-called potable uh, if, in Switzerland, you can be pretty sure things are regulated. Okay, so another project I had that I thought was really cool was uh, this malaria box project. And uh, the malaria box uh, concept was to take uh, from uh, the 250,000 active anti-malarials that had come out of screening 6 million compounds and trying to distill those down into a reasonable number, of small number of compounds that would uh, relate to that amount of diversity. So there were 400 diverse compounds selected out of this 250,000 that represented uh, at least some of the diversity of that uh, 250,000 actives. These were confirmed as blood stage active and malarial hits, but little was known about them, their mechanism of action, what else they would do, and so on. And um, what, uh, what Medicines for Malaria Venture did was they, they purchased these 400 chemicals and put them into a set, uh, basically uh, uh, five of these uh, 96 well plates. I know that KK Ojo sitting in the back here got one set of these. And they were sent around the world free and not limited to the malaria field. And people tested them in every dang thing you could think of, from cancer to worms to all kinds of different protozoa infections, to bacterial infections, tuberculosis, HIV, you, know, you name it, almost always it was done. Um, and what had happened, though, is that um, they, everybody had agreed to, uh, to share the data in the public domain at the end, but of course, even we hadn't shared the data in the public domain, though we had signed something saying we had, uh, just because you do the experiment and then if there's something really exciting, you keep working on it and publish it. If it's kind of mildly exciting, you move on to the next thing. And that's what happened to almost all of the 200 labs that had gotten these uh, sets and had done the work. Uh, so, so what I did was I contacted uh, these uh, 200 labs that were spread all over the world. Some of the diversity of sites is shown here, but basically every continent except for Antarctica, I believe, was uh, doing work on them. I'm not sure why Antarctica had seen, but uh, and they had been used in all kinds of different ways, both to look at targets and, and to look at how malaria went. And the data is, uh, in, in bugging everybody to, to put the data accessible, uh, almost all the groups uh, made their 
uh, output open in this open source uh, place called Kimball.org. There were already 25 publications, uh, about 12 more uh, happened during the time I was getting rid of people. And uh, uh, together with all of these co-authors, uh, turned out in the end, 181 co-authors and myself uh, are, are, have submitted a summary paper of the data uh, that represents the work that was done in about 60 groups uh, for this summarizing the activity profile. And some of the results from this that, that came out is that um, they were put through about 119 different mechanism of action screens. So this is to figure out the biochemical and cellular pathways that works on uh, both to inhibit malaria but the other pathogens that were studied. And there were some surprising associations uh, of different things. Uh, there, were, uh, there were output in a field called metabolomics where they would apply the drug and then see what happens to the metabolic changes in the cell uh, shown by this figure here. Um, uh, and these are all of the malaria box compounds from one of the particular plates um, with some that uh, actually look a lot like a known drug for malaria. Uh, this is uh, showing chemical genomics where they serially knocked out a lot of genes in uh, in malaria and looked at the response to the different gene knockouts. And they were able to pick up a number of compounds that uh, worked quite similarly to artemisinin, some of which had structures that you could look at and say, oh yeah, that makes sense, and some of which that didn't, which uh, belies uh, uh, perhaps a novel, uh, novel mechanism related to artemisinin that, that one, one should follow up on more. Um, there were a ton of cell-based or so-called phenotypic screens that were conducted on uh, almost 50 on malaria, uh, 18 on different protozoa, uh, 13 on worms, uh, 12 on bacteria and mycobacteria, yeast, HIV, even whole mosquitoes were tested and zebrafish, and then a ton of mammalian cell lines, uh, 73 different mammalian cell lines. Um, I'll show you more about that in the cancer screen. But this ended up uh, giving us some promising anti-malarials and uh, things that we really liked for things that had activity like the artemisinins, but gave us activity against the gametocytes. So this should stop transmission immediately, which none of the available drugs do. Some of which had activity against all of the different uh, uh, stages of malaria. So these were very promising leads. Um, there were a number of non-toxic anti-protozoan drugs that are great for things like sleeping sickness and, and Chagas disease and leishmaniasis and so on. And then uh, a lot of drugs, uh, less but uh, quite a few drugs that are active against uh, uh, worms that are of importance, such as Ruchia malayi that gives you the elephantiasis or lymphatic filariasis, Trichuris trichurii, which is whipworm that's a common cause of, uh, of anemia in little kids and Ancelostoma uh, salonicum, which is hookworm, another cause of anemia in little kids. And then this uh, shows you one screen that was done by the National Cancer Institute, where they took uh, almost 60 cancer cell lines and uh, screened the various drugs. And you can kind of pick out some interesting patterns that, that showed up with these, like uh, this drug here that looks like it's very active against a variety of melanoma lines actually is active against a, a number of col colon lines. And uh, this pattern seems to repeat down the list. Uh, it turns out one of these uh, has been studied uh, in a follow-up uh, in colon cancer lines. This, this is the same drug I was just pointing out. And uh, uh, shows great activity uh, uh, and, and may be uh, uh, possible to develop this. It's, it is a, uh, it does have some chemical uh, uh, challenges to it in terms of uh, uh, being a, a large molecule, so it may be difficult to further optimize it, but it's at the level of already being uh, uh, efficacy for uh, anti-cancer and it has very low toxicity to the whole organism. Uh, and this is now under investigation in colon cancer for human cancer. So um, really in summary of these malaria box findings, these were uh, active non-toxic compounds that were many uh, leads found for various uh, uh, single cell parasites, uh, worms, uh, for uh, anti-cancer, 
And uh, this output is now available to the literature, uh, to you guys, but um, uh, for follow-up programs and that sort of thing. I think for you guys as allergy and immunologists, you might think about uh, the next compounds, which I'll talk about in a moment, called the pathogen box, which are about to be released by Medicines for Malaria Venture. Any questions about the malaria box? Or I go on to some pretty travel pictures. <laughs> Yes. Not about your malaria box, but have they tried to target the mosquito itself? Like, take maybe some something like the thing that's killing honeybees. Maybe they can find a mite that will kill mosquitoes that you yeah. can infect them with. There's a lot of cool uh, uh, plans out there. You know, the the Gates Foundation runs these uh, grand challenges, and I've had the fortune of attending a few of those uh, readouts for that. And people are trying all kinds of things, like genetically altering the males so that they get out there and, and don't impregnate the females. They tried uh, making the mosquitoes so when they encounter the malaria parasite, instead of staying healthy, they die immediately. Uh, they've tried, um, uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, feeding the mosquitoes a, um, a genetically altered organism that fights off uh, the malaria effectively so it doesn't affect the, the mosquito. So there's a variety of mechanisms that are early trials for out the mosquito. Sir, yes. on that theme, the resistant, <coughs> the mosquitoes that are resistant to malaria, what do they do? What is known about their anti-malarial activity and has that yeah. been used for drugs? Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think people are looking at that, Bill, that's, uh, the, I shouldn't step away from the microphone, but people are looking at that so that the, it's only the anopheline species that are uh, sensitive and the, the Aedes form seem to kill malaria effectively using an iron type mechanism as it invades them. So people are looking at genetically altering the anophelines. The, the trick is you have, you have to genetically alter them and then you have to make them somehow more uh, to penetrate the, the given population in a way, right? Because you can only release so many. Um, so there's, there's all these kind of cool things to genetically alter and then make the mosquitoes more sexy or something like that. So they'll get, they'll get oh, their genetic... I guess what out. I was thinking is, are they, do the resistant mosquitoes, do they secrete peptides or something that could be exploited? Are there, is there some immune response of those mosquitoes? Yeah, it's an iron-based uh, attack than the immune mosquitoes that, that has been used. But there are uh, de novo peptides that have been found through screens that now they're making uh, both altered mosquitoes and uh, the uh, biomass in the mosquito gut to actually kill the parasites. So, yes? You spoke about experimental models with mice and primates. Is there any natural animal reservoir for malaria? Yeah, not for four out of five of the species. There, uh, there used to be just uh, uh, four species of malaria Valley, Vivax, uh, Malariae, and Falciparum. And recently, a primate uh, species has uh, uh, merged into uh, humans in um, uh, Southeast Asia. And that, that does have a reservoir. But for eradication purposes, that's a very small number of malaria cases. So uh, it's not, not sort of to be a blip and dealable. OK, so. Um, pictures. Uh, we One of the things that was cool being over in Europe is we spent a couple of weeks around Christmas time uh, traveling the capitals in East uh, uh, Europe where we hadn't uh, been. So this is a picture of the Christmas market in Budapest. Uh, we also, uh, here's another picture from Budapest and this is Vienna at Christmas going to the, uh, to the uh, Spanish uh, uh, writing school that's in uh, downtown Vienna. Um, and out at the markets and, and the beautiful coffee houses. So uh, I want to finish with this uh, pathogen box concept. Uh, and this is something that those of you that are experimentalists can take advantage of. So this is similar to the malaria box. It's going to be 400 compounds that will be provided free to the working public. Uh, the Gates Foundation loved this concept so much, they came back to MMB and said, why don't you put together a box of things that covers multiple pathogens that we're interested in across uh, uh, the, you know, basically that, that cause plagues in the developing world. And so the uh, uh, Medicines for Malaria Venture and uh, a 
lot of partners have put together this box that uh, has just been released uh, that includes uh, 400 drug-like compounds that include active, uh, actives against all these different things. All you have to agree if you uh, sign up for this is to publish the results, just like before. And uh, uh, you don't really have to, if you're, you're working on something in allergic diseases or immunology or whatever, that's fine with them. Uh, it just, you have to tell them what you're going to do with it. Um, so the, the way this was put together is they took a chemical selection committee of, of chemists to try and pick the very best starts for the different diseases. Uh, this was staffed by a variety of people at, um, at MMV, including uh, myself. Uh, and I was the only person there that actually was sort of an infectious disease expert. Everybody was an expert on malaria, but nobody knew much about these different uh, infectious diseases. So that was fun. Uh, that they could use me in that way as they were assembling this box. And then they had a ton of partners that actually tested the bioactivity of these things. And one of the things that was surprising to me that wasn't surprising to pharma at all was that uh, about 60% of the published compounds, when we went and resynthesized them and retested them, and uh, two or three labs actually, about 60% of the compounds had absolutely no activity uh, despite being a published hit uh, from various screens and so on. And there's probably all kinds of reasons for this. I don't like the idea that it's scientific malfeasance, but things can be mislabeled, things can degrade as they sit in libraries, and it's actually the degradation products that cause the death. So uh, one important part of this was just resynthesizing and making sure they're good chemical matter and then retesting them against the various diseases. And this is where our partners came in uh, who tested all of these things, including K.K. Ojo in the back who helped us with this project. And so uh, this basically shows you a boil down of the, of the different compounds. Uh, in the final box, uh, they were mostly malaria compounds. I won't say more than half, but uh, perhaps two thirds. But there were a variety of active compounds for the various other diseases. And uh, the pathogen box has just been launched in December they're actually shipping uh, their first boxes, I think, here in January. Um, over 800 compounds were acquired and synthesized for us to be able to pick these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, compounds. 400 uh, finally were selected. Those include some uh, standards that are positive for each of the diseases uh, that are well known. And uh, the MMV is going to go on further to do uh, uh, metabolism and uh, uh, pharmacokinetic studies in mice uh, with all of these compounds. So uh, if uh, anyone in the room is, is interested, I've already put in our order for the lab, but if anybody in the room is interested in actually studying these, these turned out, to, as I mentioned, similar compounds to these turned out to be wonderful starts for a variety of different things, such as anti-cancer and so on. Uh, it just turns out if you have a bioactive compound that gets in a cell, it may do a variety of surprising things. And that's where the pathogen box and the malaria box has uh, been extremely useful. So I'll wrap up by thanking uh, the many people that helped in the pathogen box. Uh, uh, and I won't talk through each group that uh, tested these things. Uh, this is me cross-country skiing up in the Jura, very happy for my year away skiing in Zermatt near the uh, Matterhorn uh, downhill skiing. And I really have to thank uh, the Jeannie Morazzo, Paul Pottinger, K.K. Ojo, John Lynch, others who picked up my jobs while I was gone. Uh, a small amount of funding from University of Washington, a big amount of funding from Medicines for Malaria Venture. Uh, the people at Medicines for Malaria Venture at the top, like Tim Wells, who, who made my visit wonderful. And, and especially for my wife for uh, offering to come along. So uh, with that, I'll stop here and uh, take any questions or uh, comments. Now, one comment that strikes me, <coughs> the, the um, this box concept is almost the opposite of the way NIH used to fund grants. If you just went in with what was called a fishing expedition, that was going to be rejected. You had to have a constructive hypothesis here is just the opposite of that, uh, and yet leading, presumably, to very novel outcomes. The, the question 
a very unstructured question. I'm not sure it's sensible, but I'm just wondering if people have studied sort of the evolution of malaria, how we got to this situation, what, what's the parasite's purpose in the world, mm. and if there's any, if you look at it that way, does that help in any way figuring out how to eradicate it? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, and I think, I think it does help to look back uh, historically. So originally, um, the, the thought was that uh, Plasmonium bivaxial valley and malaria, which tend not to kill humans, is very well adapted and very old compared to humans. And P. falciparum is very new uh, based on what's called molecular time clocks, how quickly mutations occur and all that sort of thing. Um, but it, that, that look has been revised uh, because when we look carefully at the genetics, the time clock for falciparum is off. And it's, it's almost as old as the other species. So. You know, classical parasitologists like to say that a, that, a, uh, that a parasite that kills us is a very poorly adapted parasite. But falciparum has, has gone to the point where almost everybody that's over the age of five in sub-Saharan Africa, where it's transmitted a lot, is parasitemic and can transmit it back to the mosquito. So in effect, it's, it's found a wonderful niche there to be able to transmit itself. The downside for it is it kills pregnant individuals when they're pregnant the first time and children that are between zero and five. In the evolutionary uh, pressure kind of thing, one could argue that's not enough pressure to wipe out a pathogen or whatever because uh, it's not terribly effective in killing all the children. Some of them make it to adulthood and so on. So I think what it tells us is that we need to focus on the most vulnerable population for, and that's the kids that are zero to five and uh, the women that are pregnant. Um, you know, that, that helps us to, to design drugs at MMV to be very safe in pregnancy and very safe for children and during development. Um, how that, uh, that, we, that can be used to actually uh, mess up the, the pathogen is one other, there's one other thing which I mentioned, which is the mutation rate in P. falciparum is extraordinarily high. And so now we know that no drug can be, can be marketed as a single drug because we know that inevitably, once it hits a population of 100,000 or more, resistance will emerge because of that high mutation rate. So even when you require eight different mutations, you're gonna see that emerge in P. falciparum. Uh, which has happened with things like chloroquine and, and other uh, uh, things. For us that are planning on going to Sub-Saharan Africa, what is the recommended prophylaxis now for us tourists? For Sub-Saharan uh, sub Africa, most people, uh, it's, it's very individualized, and everybody should see a, a travel doctor. But for most people, it's going to be malarone taken day, daily uh, while you're there and for seven days after you leave malaria, after you leave malaria area has the lowest incidence of side effects and, uh, um, and is, is still effective, uh, one would say 98% effective. Do, in do you start before travel? Do you start it before you uh, go? A day or two before just travel, to, partly to, weeks just before. to see if you're going to have intolerance, uh, partly to build up the level. Yes? Since you commented that it was an iron mechanism that seemed to allow these bugs to be killed, the sickle cell hemoglobin predispose these people to contract malaria versus a non-sickle hemoglobin? That actually protects them so okay. that the uh, people even with a uh, homozygous, heterozygous uh, sickle cell trait will have less severe malaria than people that are, uh, you know, uh, wild type, wild type. Uh, people that are, uh, you know, sickle, sickle trait uh, get severe sickle crises and so on, but they're actually protected from death from, uh, from malaria as well. So that's probably what drove the trait into the population. Uh, that and thalassemia, which also protects you to some degree from fatal malaria. So get a transplant I just have this is a totally tangential question, but something that's been in the news lately is Zika virus. Any, virus, any yes. comments about the yeah. association with microcephaly? And yeah, that is fascinating. I think the, the mechanism of action is unknown. So the question is about Zika virus, which is this mosquito virus. It's very well adapted for mosquitoes, but gives a rash 
arthritis and uh, uh, systemic fever syndrome, uh, but has been associated with uh, something like a 50-fold increase in microencephaly in countries that monitor that, like Brazil and so on, and probably much higher in uh, Caribbean region, uh, in uh, Mexico and below, uh, down to south. Uh, in uh, Gather, we had our first case of Zika virus-associated microencephaly in Hawaii, but it was someone that had traveled from Brazil, not acquired it in Hawaii, uh, as, was pre as was initially thought. So uh, that, you know, those kinds of emerging viruses remain a challenge, but I think the world is getting really fast at figuring out these kind of associations and so on. So that's a remarkable uh, uh, find. Uh, but there can be some expectation that this will be moving into our southern United States soon of the, the movement of the virus. You know, there's dengue now in the big island of Hawaii. What um, what keeps us from having malaria in the continental United States? Yeah, the, um, you know, the, we used to have a ton of malaria. In fact, the only medicine that was really effective for anything that was carried by Lewis and Clark uh, uh, group was uh, quinine uh, because they, they encountered so much malaria as they traveled across uh, it was mainly Plasmodium vivax, which overwinters really well and so on. Uh, but the, um, the, it was wiped out in the uh, late 40s, early 50s uh, through the Tennessee Valley Authority and other uh, sort of mass treatment effects. So that was an example where we were able to basically eliminate a disease using mass treatment uh, and, of course, mosquito control and so on. So it could, it could and occasionally reemerges uh, in areas like Florida and uh, New Jersey one summer, a few summers back. Uh, it's, it's usually quickly picked up by the health department. People are treated uh, in sort of a circle around that and, and transmission is stopped. But we still have the Anopheles that could transmit. Um, similar problem, of course, with these viruses that are emerging. And there's some concern that we could start seeing chikungunya soon as that's been moving rapidly towards the U.S. <laughs> Yes. So a lot of the new drugs that we're developing in allergy are really anti-TH2 stands. And so has that kind of gotten, like, I, I, we I do a lot of the clinical work. We don't tell people, don't go to Africa while you're on potentially anti-PSLP, anti-IL-13, IL-5, all that kind of thing. Has that hit the travel docs and the ID antiparasitics? It's interesting because uh, we get people referred into our travel clinics all the time that are on biologics, uh, yeah. you know, the antibodies that shape the immune response and so on. And a lot of times there just isn't sufficient information to, to, to tell them whether their travel pre-travel vaccines are going to be effective. Of course, we all need to, and, and I know you guys are, we all need to be really vigilant about getting everybody vaccinated up the hoo-ha before we do any immune modulation to them. And uh, we should be thinking about the travel vaccines as well as uh, things like pneumococcus. And so on. And then, uh, you know, I think being especially careful with prophylaxis uh, for people that are on immunomodulators. But you bring up a question which is that's interesting about anti TH2. Is that going to make them more, say, accept, uh, more receptive to worm infections or something like that, like uh, schistosomiasis and so on? That has yet to be shown, but uh, to be an interesting uh, biological probe as to send these travelers there. Get them into uh, paddling around and just as a biasis. But if I were you, I would just advise your pa your patients to take some Fosiquanil about uh, six weeks after they've been paddling around just the waters. Um, <laughs> that, that really yes. Is there any more work on the vaccine? I mean, this is mostly how to treat the organism, but why is it so hard to vaccinate for a yeah. while? It, it, it modulates its antigens in a systemic antigen variation uh, across many different types of antigens on its surface. So it, uh, the, the vaccine that, that isn't great is it directed towards a sporozoid, which is what the mosquito injects, that tends not to, to vary as much. But now it's known that it, it, there are variations in that strain that are not protected by the vaccine. Um, so people are working hard on vaccines that would attack the liver stages, which is another area where isn't as much antigenic variation. Um, and in fact, the group over at CIDR, uh, led by Stefan Kappa, 
uh, have a good uh, vaccine that's going along with that. There's also live virus type vaccines, or live parasite type vaccines that are coming along that are genetically altered, sort of like the polio virus effect. So we'll see how that, that develops. But I would say vaccines that are really effective are another uh, eight years off at minimum. So it's like HIV, it's got enough antigen shifting that there's no conserved sites. That you exactly, can... exactly. Yeah. Wes, thank you.